Hello everyone, today is Cracky. <laughs> Number one today is Thursday, September 30, 2018. This is a week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everyone for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So thank you for that. This is claim screen, as you know, as you know, let me slow down here a little bit. You could lose money trading. Or as I often say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, let's talk about current market conditions, obviously. And lately we've been talking about the fact that we've been in a new bull leg, and I think we still are in that. And of course, it's September, October now, or we're moving into October. And September, October tend to be volatile months. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides. And then towards the end of the presentation, and today we should have plenty enough time to get to other questions. But feel free to ask questions in general once we get towards the end of the presentation. I'll let you know when that is. And then your favorite stock picks. Wait until I open it up to live charts for that. And if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time so this week's focus is six reasons and counting why you can't trade so at the last minute i decided that there's going to be more than just six now i hate when somebody presents a problem and doesn't give you a solution so we will give you a solution i will give you a solution towards the end of the presentation there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions or about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's talk about six reasons and counting why you can't trade. Number one, you wing it. Number two, following a plan is hard. Number three, we all tend to deal in exacts. Logic doesn't often apply. You have no patience. And trying to avoid losses is often what creates them. And that comes in two different forms. And at the last minute, I added physiology. It's interesting that I put six reasons in counting, and I was going to explain that there's got to be more than six. But these are the first six that I came over. These are the first six that I came up with after looking at a prior presentation. And then I began thinking there has to be more, and that's where physiology came in at the last minute. So the number one problem is you wing it. Most people don't follow a plan. Now, as I've said quite a bit, one day I was getting ready to go for a walk, and I was pondering before I went on my walk, why is it that most people don't plan their trades? And about halfway through my walk, I realized, well, it's because the moment you make a plan is the exact moment that you, you admit that you could be wrong. Now, what's interesting is I'll often have these thoughts or sayings or whatever, and then I'll later realize that somebody said that or discovered that long before I ever did. I've been proofing Linda Rasky's book. And I noticed that she had quoted somebody in there that talked about uh, big, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space or something similar to that. That's something that I say all the time. And I thought I was the first person to say that. But obviously, people said it long before me. So I was thinking, OK, well, I figured this out from a psychological standpoint that why am why people don't plan their trades is because the moment they plan a trade is the moment they admit they could be wrong. And then I recently read in the Undoing Project, which is about Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, which we'll quote in a few minutes even further. But in the book, they say to acknowledge uncertainty was to admit the possibility of error. 
So we like to deal in certainty, which we'll get to in just a minute or two. And the reason most people don't plan their trades is, again, because the moment you plan a trade, you admit that you could be wrong. Now, you don't follow a plan because following a plan is hard. And what's interesting is even and especially if that means doing nothing. A couple days ago, I got an email. This was the trade that set up. We had a buy that triggered on this day here. I think it was in early August. Stop goes here. And then what happened? Well, I just kind of dived and went sideways. So what do you do? Well, nothing. You leave the stop in place. And then a few days ago, the stock took off. So you bump the stop up to break even, take some partial profits. And then I receive an email. As soon as it gapped open, I sold ARWR yesterday. Well, why did he sell? Why did he break the plan? Well, because he was likely trying to avoid pain, or as we'll see in one minute, he was trying to interject some logic. The stock tried to take off, and then it died. And the market's been doing pretty good lately. The stock's kind of dying, not going anywhere. Maybe it's time to get out. Well, if you're following some method, other methodology that puts some sort of time stamp on the trade, or time in the trade, I should say, then by all means, get out. But if you're following a specific plan that says, we're just going to stay in until stopped out, or we get the profit target and trailer stop, then that's what you should do. Now, Ken Lambert once said, doing nothing is harder than it looks. Now, he was referring to waiting for setups and waiting for market conditions to be conducive. But this also applies to sitting in a trade that's treading water. As I often say, we have many, many dead money reports and that was just sort of a dead money report it's like okay yeah it's not acting right it's going sideways it's losing a little after a false rally i'm not too excited about the stock so what do i do well let's just honor our stop and let the chips fall where they may the problem or one of the problems i should say and i'm pretty bad at demarketing i'm always demarketing myself but the problem with my methodology and momentum trading in general and trend following in general, so it's not just my methodology, but the problem is a lot of your success, a huge part of your success, let me rewind it, a huge part of your success depends upon you catching the occasional outlier. Now, I do make them sound kind of elusive, and I can't solve for that. If I could solve for that, you'd never see my fat ass again. I don't know when that big outlier is going to come along, but you have to keep playing for when they do. Now, it doesn't mean that you're trading like a madman. Sometimes you're just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for setups, and that could be tough, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, getting back to the trade that this gentleman exited the day before took off. One of the reasons that he likely exited is because the brain registers losses 2.5 times more intensely than it feels gains, according to Dr. Janice Dorn. Now, when I was putting his presentation, <laughs> rewind that group. When I was putting his presentation together, I'm like, well, how do they know that? Well, I think in the case of Dr. Janice Dorn, there were some studies that were done with, with actual dopamine. Now, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman said people feel roughly twice as bad as a loss than the pleasure that comes from an equal gain. And this is why a lot of cam gamblers end up going downhill, or this is why gambling is so addictive and that's because you're getting more of a rush it's a negative rush but it's a rush nonetheless from losing money and you're getting you're not getting an equal pleasure from that gain so you would have to win twice as much as you lose to sort of 
balance things out a little bit. And that's how a lot of people end up in a negative spiral with this. Also, not to digress too far, but if you start looking into the dopamine, what's the song? I think Paramore. I'm, I'm trying to think of the band's name, but it used to take one. Now it takes four. And she's referring to drugs in the song. You don't get me high anymore. Well, your brain kind of gets numb to the dopamine to where it takes more and more and more. So that's part of that downward spiral. And they also said that people will go to great lengths to avoid pain. So exiting a trade that's going against you, even though you're not stopped out, why do you do that? Well, you do that because you have a fear of more pain. And the market's a really bad teacher. I don't know how what's an exact number to give you, but let's just say 10. That's a pretty big number. That's a pretty ugly number. That's a pretty depressing number. But let's say you get stopped out 10 times in a row. It's going to be really, really, really hard to take that 11th trade. But that 11th trade might just be the one that works. I recently got stopped out, and I, I think I lost count. And quite frankly, I almost didn't take the last trade. But I recently got stopped out about probably four times in a row on a New Zealand dollar. Trading a little hourly bow tie off a major low. It's kind of a little S&G type of trade. It's not my bread and butter, but it's something I like to do in Forex because it's a more efficient market. Now, if you look under methodology and the learning management system, you'll see that I have a presentation on doing just that. And I explain the exact system, so to speak, that I'm following or setups that I'm following there using the bow ties on an hourly basis. But anyway, it's a hard way to trade because it's like beating your head against the wall. It feels so good when you stop, right? Well, that one time we do stop is when it takes off without you. Not to say that this position is going to work, but right before I went live with this presentation, it was beginning to rally sharply. And I began thinking, if I would have ignored that trade, which I really thought about doing, because I wanted to avoid any more damn pain in the New Zealand dollar, <laughs> then I would have missed that move. Now, let's not start kissing each other just yet because it still could stop at a loss. But you get the idea. Avoiding a loss, avoiding a pain, is avoiding pain is a huge emotion, and it's been proven. Number three, you like to deal in exacts. In markets, they, there often aren't any exacts. People always say, Dave, hey, exactly where should I place a stop? Like, well, it depends. And even if you do place a stop, sometimes a little bit of discretion can help. For instance, we were long a stock and we had a stop STOP at nine, came down. I think there was 200 shares traded right about nine. It never did ask below nine so a contingency order might have helped keep you in but the point is yeah the stop was at nine mechanically it did get hit technically it did get hit but it just sort of skirted that little area just 200 shares and that was it and then it kept on going back up or turned back up i should say somebody asked me stopped at nine why did you just place your stop at 899 well, that's another one of those never see my fat ass again things. If I knew that I could place a stop at 899 and it would only go to 9, then I would own the world if I could be that exact in my trading. So trading is really not a game of exacts. Now, I'm kind of insinuating here a little discretion. And if you look at the money management, you'll see that. Let's say your stops here and the market comes down here, especially let me just redraw this. So what I'm talking about is or what I'm insinuating is possibly a little discretion. Let's say a market closes like right here. And it's pretty close to that stop. And, you know, the next day it's probably going to either gap through it or at least come down and touch it. So you could pull your stop on the open. And again, this is covered under discretion. And then if the market turns it back right back around, you could actually put a hard stop back in. 
So that's a case where a market doesn't necessarily move in exacts. And a lot of times, especially in more recent years, I've been working really hard to make the service work mechanical or mechanically for those people who have a hard time following. But it's been a little bit harder in more recent years. Things sometimes get stopped out to a penny. We get within a few cents of an initial profit target. It doesn't quite get there. And a little common sense and discretion can get you through these lack of exact movements. But that's that's kind of it's kind of tough if you lack the discipline to put that little bit of discretion. The problem with discretion is if you don't have a lot of discipline, it's kind of like you can't get a little bit pregnant. OK, so the point is like, yeah, maybe give it a little wiggle room about this around to stop. But if it keeps dropping, you have to admit defeat and get out. Amos Tversky in the aforementioned book, The Undoing Project. And if you go to DaveLander.com slash books to read, you'll find a link there. And he was quoted as saying, man is a deterministic device thrown into a probability. Yeah. <laughs> Easy for me to say. Man is a determined. It's <laughs> baked in a buttery, flaky crust. <laughs> Man is a deterministic device thrown into a probabilistic universe. Amen. And there's a lot of unknown and uncertainties in trading. And that's where people have such hard times is, is that they, they want the certainty. You need some certainty in life. You need to know that the road to get you to your job is going to be there. You need to know that that's not going to change, or if there's something wrong with it, there's an alternate route. There's a lot of certainty that your life depends on. And I'm sure if you're a surgeon or something, there's a tremendous amount of cert certainty. And if you're an engineer, as I often say, your bridges can't fall down. So you need a lot of certainty. Number four, you apply logic. This should be logic. You apply logic. And logic doesn't often apply. Just yesterday, I received an email about AMD. Five times sales. Makes no sense. So many shares controlled at powers at B that paid under two bucks. And he went on to give a few other logical arguments about why AMD should not be going up. But it is. Now, let me see. Earlier, right before I went live with this presentation, AMD was up about 5%. I see it's only up about 80 cents now, but it's higher than it was in spite of this logic. Now, this might be the exact top. And maybe this might not turn out to be the best example in the world, but a lot of people have been poo-pooing AMD all along the way. What's the old saying? Trends exist as long as people fight them. One of my favorite sayings, I even bought the domain at one point. I don't know if I renewed it. I've got so many domains. Uh, I've been letting them expire as of late because it's just a waste of money. Although I have to admit, one of my friends just sold one of his domains for a, a chunk of change. He has the same sickness as me. But anyway, long story endless. Don't confuse issue with facts. Do not confuse issue with facts. I own those domains. And I think that's a wonderful saying when it comes to trading. And if you've emailed me in the past, you probably know that I'll often reply <laughs> to something like the AMD email with don't confuse issue with facts. Actually, yesterday I, I said... Donnie Think Uptrend from Donnie Think Vacuum. Do a YouTube on it. Number five, you have no patience. As I say, ad nauseum, you're a person of action. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here today watching this presentation. Otherwise, you wouldn't be a successful doctor, lawyer, automatic transmission mechanic, or whatever profession you're in and are successful in. So 
Being a person of action is great for life, but bad for trading. So again, in this particular case, getting back to the example of the ARWR, being a person of action to try to avoid pain, which is very important in life. You don't want to step out onto, or I should say, if a car is coming at you, you want to jump out of the way. So avoiding pain is part of our makeup. It's part of what keeps us alive. I was reading something recently. I don't know if it was in the Undoing Project or think about it then in uh, The Art of Thinking Clearly, where I talked about the fact that back in the caveman days, if everybody around you took off running because they sense some imminent danger, you better run first and then ask questions later. So we have this ingrained in us to avoid danger. Now, getting back to the being patient, Steve Edmondson once said, I spent a lot of time researching things we ultimately don't do. Ken Lambert, again, says doing nothing is harder than it looks. Charlie Munger, I'm not a big value investor guy, but the wit and wisdom of Charlie Munger is pretty darn good. It's worth reading. And I've quoted him a little bit here and there. It takes character to sit there. It takes character to sit there with all that cash and do nothing. I didn't get to where I am by going after mediocre opportunities. And of course, the late great Tom Petty said the waiting is the hardest part. As I preach ad nauseum, trading done properly can be quite boring. And I've done it's I don't know what's wrong with my mouth today. Let me get some water. I have done extensive presentations where I've talked about the two forms of patience, entire presentations just on that. But in a nutshell, when you're trading, you're doing one of two things. One, you're either waiting for setups or number two, once you're in a position, you're waiting for the market to move. I have several setups on. One is going against me. So I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for something to happen. On the other two, or the one I should say, one of the other ones, I'm waiting for it to hit the initial profit target. On the other one, it's already hit the profit target. I'm waiting for it to do something so I can trail my stop higher. I'm going to resist the temptation, the constant temptation to micromanage. I am not immune to all the things that I preach about because I'm human. And in one second, we'll talk about the shared psychology that we have and the shared physiology. As I've said before, the microwave society has ruined you. Us older farts might have an unfair advantage. People, I aggravate people who know me because I'm not a huge fan of a cell phone. Sometimes I leave it at home, although I have to admit in more recent times, I find myself using it more and more to check emails and things like that. But years ago, I was at a presentation and they said that the phone is for your convenience. And that really struck a chord with me. <laughs> Now, I expect my friends to answer their cell phones, but that's a different story altogether. But if you're a little younger and you've grown up with a phone in your pocket and texting and instant messages and all those other things, then that's another one of those things can be quite addictive and you just have grown accustomed to doing this. You're also, you also have no patience because the way society, the microwave society has evolved as i say ad nauseum i'm sick of myself saying it but it was just 
few months ago, the last video store that I know of within 100 miles, probably within 1,000 miles, closed down. I figured they were selling crack or something. It was just some sort of bodega type of action going on there. I guess it's not a bodega, but you get the idea. Something behind the counter. And I was shocked that they stayed in business as long as they did. No one has the patience anymore to go out and get a movie. Number six, trying to avoid losses, it is often what creates them. If you use too tight of a stop, you're going to get stopped out. As I've said quite often, I had someone, I think, call me up with 20, I always forget, it's 20 or 21 times in a row they got stopped out. Where they're doing one or two things, or probably a combination thereof, either their stock selection is really, 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 really bad, or more likely their stops are flat out too tight. As I've said quite a bit, I've helped a lot of people who call me frustrated with their trading, and I've helped a lot of people by saying, look, just loosen your stops up a little bit, and you will catch more winners. Again, getting back to that elusive thing, which I was told to stop saying it's so elusive, but getting back to that elusive thing, A trend following methodology depends on the occasional outlier. And if you're using too tight of a stop, you're never going to catch that outlier or the chances of catching that outlier are slim and none. And as a trader friend of mine used to say, and slim just left town. Now, along those lines, it will keep you out of the big winners. So, if you're getting stopped out right before stock takes off, this one trade here might be the trade that makes your entire year. And that's the hard part. And that's something that I see happen over and over again. As I preach ad nauseum, people come on the trading service, and then I hit a rough patch, and then they quit. And then what happens next? I start knocking the cover off the ball. The problem is I don't know when I'm going to knock the cover off the ball again. As I've said before, one client told me he didn't quit the service, but he just quit trading it for a while, and he got busy at work and for whatever reasons. I wasn't doing that good during that period anyway, so it's probably a combination of those things. And then he checks back in a week later, and I had a portfolio full of big winners. And he said, Dave, I feel like I broke up with my fiance, and the next Saturday night she won the Powerball. Well, that's trading. And if you are using too tight of stops or micromanaging yourself, micromanaging the, again, I don't know what's wrong with my mouth today. If you're using too tight of stops or micromanaging your trades, you're never going to catch those winners. Now, one slide that I found while putting this together this morning is from a psychological perspective, we're just scratching the surface, and that's true. And we touched upon these things today, or most of these things, I should say, but we have a need to be right. We have a need to take action, a need for certainty, and a need to avoid pain. We also have a need for positive feedback, and this is something that I knew we wouldn't have enough time to get into today, but just kind of, again, scratching the surface on that. Outcome bias is something that plagues us, and I read about it quite often in all these behavioral finance books. But the best one so far, or recently, I should say, and I know that uh, Tversky and Kahneman or uh, Kahneman are really good with a lot of these type of outcome bias things. So I'd recommend you read those, Thinking Fast and Slow. The Undoing Project is the latest one, but it's not from them, but it's about them. But it's definitely worth reading. Uh, Michael Lewis, I believe, is the author on that one. But we have a need for positive feedback, and the danger with that becomes the outcome bias. Uh, Annie Duke is the book I was thinking about earlier. And her book is called Thinking and Bets. And again, you can find it on Books to Read. And you'll see, you'll see, you have, there's a lot of, there's a lot of presentations I've already done off that book, and there's probably going to be a lot more 
based on some of her thoughts. And I got a lot out of the book. I thought it was really good book and definitely a worthy read. But we have this outcome bias. Bad decisions sometimes can lead to really good outcomes. And one of my favorite things, and it's not just one person, because I know whenever I talk about these things, I'll get an email like, hey, you were talking about me. Well, it's happened. It's not just you, but several people have told me this. And I actually said it once. It's We all have these egos. But like somebody will show me a trade or a system or whatever, and I'll shoot some holes in it, and then they'll say, well, it worked, didn't it? And I got cocky once. I was on an institutional project. I recommended something stupid. And the hedge fund guy called me out, and I said, well, it worked, didn't it? And like, you know, after I sent the email, I'm like, ah, now I feel like an idiot because that's just what I preach against. And he came back with, well, you picked up nickels in front of a bulldozer. Congratulations. And he was right. It was a very risky type of trade. It was not worth the risk or reward. Now, the reason I said six and counting was I knew that I would likely keep adding to this. And as I was getting ready to go live with the presentation, I added in McLean's triune, triune brain. Easy for me to say. So psychologically, we could argue that we are a little different. We're all individuals. What's the old saying? It's like, uh, you're one of 5 billion, or I guess 8 billion now. You're one of 8 billion special people, just like the other 8 billion special people. But we all have a little bit different psychology. I'm a bit of a nut and kind of wild and crazy, kind of an extrovert. And some people might be more introverted. But we do share a mostly the same psychology when it comes to trading in the need to avoid pain, the fact that we experience pain twice as intensely as we do pleasure, and so on and so forth. So even though we're all a little different from a psychological standpoint, we do share a, a, the same general psychology. And our physiology doesn't help much either. Now, we all have the same physiology, and McLean coined the phrase the triune brain, meaning that we have this autonomous part of our brain deep inside of us called the reptile brain. I think that's so-called because it looks like a lizard or alligator's brain. And then on top of that, we have the paleomammalian and then the neomammalian. Now, where I get a little confused is the emotions come, the snap emotions, I should say, come mostly from the paleomammalian, but it's also been said that the lizard brain, the so-called lizard brain, creates a lot of your snap emotions. Now, the reason I say snap emotions is we also have, if you looked at, if you look at the neomammalian brain, we have the left brain, obviously, and the right brain. Well, a lot of our emotions come from our right brain, but those are more conscious type of feelings as opposed to a snap decision, that, that jump out of the way from the cab that's getting ready to hit you. That comes from deep inside our older brain parts, okay? And that's necessary to keep us alive, but that could also cause us to make a lot of bad on-the-fly trading decisions. So without getting too deep into the neuroscience, we have this old brain that can be our own worst enemy. And the solution to that, now there's a lot more to be discussed here, obviously, but the quick solution there is count to three, or as I said before, wind the clock which was a presentation on talk where I talked about how Greg Morris used to wind a clock to keep from crashing an airplane. You wind a clock, you take a breath. It helps to bypass that older primal part of your brain to get to the rest of what's sloshing around 
up there. And all it usually takes is a few seconds. And he used to wind the clock back when he was flying fighter pilots. It was an actual clock. And when he was flying airlines, he would metaphorically touch the cock, the dash or whatever you call it, and metaphorically wind the clock just to catch a breath. And one example he gave was... One example that he gave was, hope it's not a margin call. <laughs> the example he gave was they had an engine fire once. Let me just rewind that because of the, the phone in there. The example he gave was they had an engine fire once, and the call pilot said, let me shut down the engine. And he said, stop. And he caught his breath, wound the clock, whatever it took to not deal with that rush of adrenaline that comes. And he says, no, don't, don't shut the engine off because we might accidentally shut off the wrong engine. And if we do, if we can't get it restarted, we're in a lot of trouble. So what he told him was, let's monitor the situation. And if push comes to shove, we have to shut it down, we'll shut it down. But for now, let's just get the plane on the ground and see how it shakes out. And he landed the plane and no one was the wiser. No one knew that they actually lost an engine as they were coming in to land. So sometimes, again, all it takes is a few seconds to bypass that older part of your brain. So that's, I'm getting a little further ahead of myself. The point is, we know we now have a problem from a psychological standpoint and from a physiological standpoint. So how do we solve it? Well, the way you solve the physiological problem, again, without going through all the neuroscience, which I would recommend you do, but the quick answer there is to breathe Give yourself a few seconds, wind the clock metaphorically. As I've said before, after I read Greg's book where we talked about wind the clock, and after we talked in person about it, I've bought a little, as you can hear here, I bought a little airline clock, a little vintage airline clock, which I keep on my desk. When I go to micromanage or make a stupid trade, or any trade for that matter, I wind the clock. Now, I know that's kind of silly, but whatever it takes. Now, let's get back to the psychological issues. Recognizing the problem goes a long way towards fixing it. And I'm a big fan of these type of things. So if there's a problem, recognize that there is a problem. And that's the only way you ever fix a problem, obviously, is recognizing it. If you're feeling uneasy and you're trading if you're feeling that uneasiness that's good what as douglas once said you're not afraid of the markets you're afraid of your ability to do what you have to do so that's that uneasiness you may be feeling but if you are feeling that and you are following your plan, you have to embrace and accept the fact that, yes, the market may go against you, and the market may stock you out. But the only way to ever win longer term and make money is to play the game and not quit every time you're losing a little bit, provided you're not stopped out, of course. Or even worse, taking partial profits, I'm sorry, taking full profits when you should be letting some of those profits ride. So if you're feeling that uneasiness in your trading and you're also doing everything right. So if, you, if you're really uneasy, like I said earlier, as Douglas would say, there's something wrong. But a general uneasiness is normal. I am very emotional. And I get very upset very easily. I drop a lot of F-bombs, as I think I said before. 
we're downsizing right now i'm in a separate structure i can cuss and fuss all i want nobody really knows that i'm in here cussing and fussing we're getting ready to move the house where my office will be attached to the house and i'm going to make sure that's really well insulated because i know myself i'm going to be in here cussing and fussing the point i'm trying to get to is that trading in a lot of ways is unnatural and it will arouse a lot of emotions nearly every trader i've ever met tends to drop a lot of f-bombs not that i'm proud of that but it's just the nature of the business there are there are a lot of ups and downs and it could make you feel uneasy doing the hard thing it's very hard to stay in the position day after day after day or even week after week after week waiting for it to move and you're going to have that feeling like maybe i should just get out even though the stop hasn't been hit so if you are feeling that uneasiness provided of course you are following continuing to follow the plan properly and that uneasiness is not from your fear that you won't do the right thing if your uneasiness is in following the plan exactly and you're still uneasy then recognize that that's the first step to fixing it but then resist now as i often say if i had to boil everything down to whether or not you will become a successful trader is to follow the plan for just one trade follow the exact plan for just one trade i'm not a big fan of mechanical systems although I spent many years testing them. I just don't think that longer term, that's the way to trade. I think we have a brain in our heads and I think we should use it. But if you are lacking that discipline, maybe follow something mechanically or almost nearly mechanically for a while until you prove that you can do it. And again, on just one trade, follow the exact plan. And if you can do that on one trade, you've proven that you have what it takes. And as I say, now just do that again on the next 10,000 trades. But the other thing you'll have to do once you do follow that process and the results are good, bad, or indifferent, continue to follow that process, but then begin to practice a little deliberate practice through your post-mortem and go back in to create that positive feedback loop so go back in after the trade after the dust settles and say okay let me double check this stock to make sure it really was trending make sure it really was persisting or accelerating whatever the case may be that fit the particular pattern you were trading make sure it was set up and then go in and make sure the sector was set up ideally doesn't always have to you won't always get the sector and stocks within the sector and the overall market all pointing in the same direction but ideally that's what you want and it's okay to say what the hell was i thinking if you find yourself saying what the hell was i thinking then you've identified a problem and that's good that's good it's okay fixing a problem what do you have to do first you have to identify the problem so if you realize, you know, it's kind of a mediocre setup, well, next time you want to do a little bit better in your stock selection. But the true enlightenment and the true success comes not necessarily when you're when you're making the money, but when you first are following the plan and you go back in and do that postmortem and you look at the trade and say, you know what? If I saw this stock tomorrow or Forex or whatever the market, I would take the trade. And I think that's where or when I should say that's when you are finally beginning to get it when it's finally beginning to click now again beware of the outcome bias as many people often tell me well it worked didn't it and as I told the hedge fund manager once as I just said well it worked didn't it those are let's see one two three, those are the, probably the four most dangerous words next to it's different this time Okay, those are those those are eight words that are incredibly dangerous. It's different this time and it worked, didn't it? 
very, very dangerous phrases. Now, along the lines of outcome bias, we do have this need for positive feedback. And it's hard when you hit that string of losses not to just quit because we are wired for that positive feedback. And what did I say earlier? Those losses create a very, very negative emotion, at least two times greater than the positive emotion of a winning trade. And somebody in one of these presentations once said, he believed that it was more like 10 times. Now, I haven't seen that research, but I have no reason to doubt that whether, whether it's two or 10 or somewhere in between, pain hurts a lot more than pleasure makes you feel good. Or I should say pain exists, elicits a more intense emotion than the pleasure. All right. Just real quick, I've been talking about this for weeks. I need to just stop talking about it and finish it. I've created a learning management system, and I'm kind of nerdy, but I'm pretty excited about it. And a lot of times people will email me with a lot of confusion about the methodology. Like they'll come in and say they'll just have the money management completely wrong or whatever. But this way I'll be able to see where they are and track their progress. And if you make it through the entire course or all, all four of these members courses and you're still having problems, then, then I have failed. Then I've done something wrong. Or maybe you're not following what you should. And I'll get questions from people all the time who claim to be trend followers. And I'd be willing to bet I'm going to get some questions about AMD about somebody wanting to short it, even though deep down they claim to be a trend follower. Well, it's too high, or the sales are five times the earnings, or whatever that funny mental thing might be. But this way we'll know. It's like, okay, well, you obviously have gone through all this, you pass all the quizzes, so you get the methodology. Not that my methodology is be all end all, but at least we've got a solid methodology under you, at least I believe a solid methodology, now we could tweak it from here. And then that's where down the road, I'd like to do like a mastermind group, kind of like version 2.0, to where those who graduate from the courses, we take it one step further. Now, this is all open-ended, by the way. So what I mean by that is every week I'm doing these presentations and I'm studying neuroscience and psychology and I'm going through my own trials and tribulations and then I have the luxury of being able to see your trials and tribulations. So I'm going to keep adding to it as things go on. And every now and then, not that I discover a lot because most of my stuff is fairly simple and a lot of it is the same. It's mostly pullback in nature. But every now and then, I'll discover something like the five-day Dave Light IPO pattern. So that becomes part of the learning management system. And then if there's anything that's missed, I'm doing Q&A sessions every couple of weeks which I have illustrated right here. Anyway, a couple other things in there. I'm going to have 911 calls. And also, uh, the longer you stay a member, the more bonuses you'll unlock. And so I want to do private consulting too, and that'll be free. You'll get 30 minutes every so many months with me. Many times, as I often say, many people are a lot closer than they think they are. And a lot of times, all it takes is a very minor tweak. As I said a few minutes ago, like adjusting your stops and things like that. Anyway, so that's like the bonus area. I'm pretty excited about this. I hope to launch in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, uh, if you haven't watched the first four videos from Trading Full Circle, you can get them at this link here, 2 trade stocks successfully Easy for me to say. All right. Any questions? Any? You guys want to take a look at any open charts or anything. Let me just go through the market real quick and then I'll be happy to take your individual stock questions. Let's take a look at the P's. Let's see what the AMD is doing since that's kind of a fun thing to do. I almost bought AMD on the close yesterday just to make a point. Then I realized that I'm doing something that's completely outside of 
my system, and that would be kind of a silly thing to do just to make a point. All right, S&P 500. So far, not a bad day, up uh, almost a half of a percent. So far, rallying out of this little flag pattern, this little pullback. The good news here, we did find support towards this last breakout. As I said earlier, September, October, two of the most volatile months of the market. What happens, traders go away for summer, and they go to the Hamptons or whatever traders do. And they come back in the fall, and volatility usually comes back with them. Volatility is not directional, so it could be up and down so far. Let's hope the expansion will be to the upside. I know I just said hope. But so far, so good. And we're just, as I preach, and go in and watch the presentation we did a couple of weeks ago, and go into my website and read the ABC of technical analysis where I talked about a little simple trend following market timing system. And basically that system in a nutshell, for the most part, said as long as we're at or near new highs and at or near was defined at 10% for the system, then stay long. So right now, based on that silly little system, you would stay long the S&P 500. Technically, I would not worry about this market unless it came in, let's just say below 28.50. Then I'd pull my horns in a little bit. NASDAQ composite, decent day there too, a little gap higher. So far, the gap's holding. Whenever I see a gap in the morning, I am concerned that that gap is going to reverse. Sometimes for SNGs, I'll play that gap reversal. Sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. It's just an SNG type of trade, it's not my bread and butter. But this morning, I saw no reason to short the market. One, the gap wasn't that big. And two, there's no reason to fight the trend. Now, if I see a big gap down, I might go in and pick up some spiders or some spider options or whatever the case may be. Let's take a look at Russell. Russell 2000, kind of Flatsville in here. It did find support towards the top of its recent range. Not too far from all-time highs. So far, so good. Give it the benefit of the doubt. Sector reactions a little mixed. Overall, sector reaction looks pretty good. Couple of areas notwithstanding. Metals and mining not looking so hot. As you can see, just off of multi-year lows and in a downtrend. Some areas like banks not really doing that great either. Kind of wide loose and sideways. Semis overall without, uh, except for like AMD, have been wide and loose and sideways in here too. It looks like we're having a good day today. I don't know what's pushing that higher, but I'll find out by the close. Some of these areas that have been going sideways have started improving as of late, like manufacturing. So we could end up, now this is just one little small area, but we could end up with a market where these big cap stocks begin to push us higher. And that's fine with me. Retail, doing really good in here. Nice, 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 nice persistent uptrend. So far, so good there. Transports, not setting the world on fire, but just off of all-time highs, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt. If you dig through technology, especially areas like software, you can see doing pretty good, banging on new highs. So the point I'm trying to make is sector action a little bit mixed, But lately, I've been seeing that sort of as glass half full. And the reason, usually I'd like to see everything headed higher, obviously in an uptrend in a bull market. But the reason I've been seeing it as half full is if every sector looked like software or retail, then where's the new buying going to come in? And now we're seeing some buying in an area like manufacturing. It's like, okay, well, if manufacturing and some of these other areas start to wake up, then that's gonna push the indices even higher. So overall, I think market's still in okay shape. You know the routine, take things one day at a time. Let's take a look at long bonds real quick. Long bonds, a little bit of a slide as of late, but I wouldn't get too excited about long bonds unless they took out the prior lows in here. The dollar, shorter term, a little weak in here, just kind of sideways at best. As you can see, it's been in an uptrend, but now I'm beginning to trade sideways. All right, any 
Any questions? You guys want to look at any individual stocks? We got a quiet bunch today. I realize I haven't done a really good job of announcing the webinars lately. I've been tied up on this big project. All right, let's give it a going once, going twice. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Again, keep an eye out for that learning management system. I hope to launch in about two weeks, God willing. And I think you guys are going to be very impressed with that if I say so myself. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week on Thursday the 20th. Thank you so much.